Hi, my name's Alyssa. Thanks for watching today. Before we get started, we wanted to fill you in on our church. Here at Grace, we have a mission and a purpose. Our goal is to help people discover truth, decide on Jesus, demonstrate change, and deploy for others. If you're looking for a church, we would love for you to come be a part of what God is doing here at Grace. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. We would also like to invite you to one of our Sunday morning services. Check out ohiograce.com for a list of campuses and service times in your area. We have a great time gathering for music, hanging out, and learning about who God is and how that affects our lives. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace. Anybody glad to be here this morning? I know I am uh, extremely grateful to be here with my church family. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Michael, uh, the young adult pastor and one of the student pastors at our Fremont campus, and uh, just glad to be here. We are continuing in our series, going through the letter of Colossians, and written by a guy named Paul to a church in a city called Colossae, and there they are a group of mainly Gentile new believers, so non-Jewish young Christians, and they're all trying to figure out how to do this whole Christian life. And it's tough because they're being hit with these different ideas and different philosophies of who God is and what salvation consists of and how to get it, all these different things. Paul writes to clear some of that up. And that's where we left off last week is Pastor Zach did a great job explaining who exactly it is that we place our faith in. Like, who is Jesus, and what do we do with him? And so we learned last week that Jesus is able to rescue us from darkness. That in him, he provides forgiveness. That he shows us who God is. He is the image of the invisible. That all creation exists because of him and for him. And not only does he create, but he sustains and he literally holds our universe together. That he is the head of the church. He should have the highest importance in our life. And it is only through him, through Jesus, that we can have peace with God. That's the Jesus that we place our faith in. And that's also the same Jesus that Paul placed his faith in. And so his mindset as he's writing this letter, as he's living his life, is all right, God saved me, Jesus saved me. So I'm going to make my life about him. And with that in mind, uh, this morning we're going to tackle the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. But we see a description of Paul's ministry, of his life, what he was about, what he focused on, what it looked like. And so I want to pull away from that uh, three traits that we are able to look that was true of Paul's life. And those same three traits should be true of our lives as believers as well. And so, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you what those three points are, and then we'll go for them. The Christian life is painful, purposeful, powerful. Painful, purposeful, powerful. You guys ready? I'll take that as a yes. All right. First up, following Jesus might be painful. And I know this isn't the cheeriest place to start. Uh, it might sound kind of aggressive, a little negative, like, oh, Michael, what's it like to be a Christian? Pain, all pain. Like, I know it's a little harsh, but this is where Paul starts, so we're going to start here as well. Chapter 1, verse 24. says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is, the church. Paul wastes no time trying to confuse us. All right, from the first one, we're in a pause here. There's a lot going on. 
He says, with that being true of who Jesus is, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. So first question we have to ask is, all right, well, what sufferings is he talking about? And from the beginning of uh, Paul being a believer, God made it very clear that suffering was going to be a part of his future. Very clear. That God actually made it known that I will um, show him how much he must suffer for my name. So it was going to be a part, uh, and he does suffer a lot. We don't have this on the screen, but 2 Corinthians 11, Paul actually gives a summary of his life, of hardships that he's been through. And 2 Corinthians 11 says, Five times I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times beaten with rods. Once I, was, uh, I received a stoning. Three times shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I've faced dangers from rivers, robbers, my own people, from Gentiles, dangers in the city, in the wilderness, at sea, among false brothers, toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst without food, cold and without clothing, not to mention other things. There is daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. It's quite a rap sheet. <laughs> Paul has been through it. Not to mention, as he's writing this letter of Colossians, he's doing it from prison. He knows about suffering. And so when he says that, he doesn't say it lightly. Two years of being under arrest, chained and watched by a guard day and night. But he says through all of it, he is rejoicing through these awful times. And, it, and honestly, if we know about Paul at all, like if we know his writings, if we know what he's been through... The fact that he is rejoicing really shouldn't be that much of a surprise. For us, it's not a natural response. That when I go through difficult times, my, uh, my quick reaction is I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I feel entitled. I'm like, God, this, why is this happening? Just be much easier if. But Paul doesn't do that. He rejoices. And it shouldn't be a surprise. We see stories uh, like Acts chapter 16 where Paul and a guy named Silas, they're traveling, they're doing ministry, they're preaching. And uh, they do a miracle. They actually heal a girl uh, who was demon-possessed. They heal her. And then everyone else around them didn't like that so much. So they accused Paul and Silas. They had them beaten with rods. Then they were thrown into prison. It's a long day. And it says at midnight when they're in jail, what are they doing? They're not complaining. They're not sleeping. They're not frustrated. They are praying and singing hymns to God. It's like, what? That is not the response that I'd probably have, that most of us probably wouldn't. But he has shown a track record of rejoicing through suffering. And if you notice in that verse that we read, what does he do it for? He's suffering, it says, for you, for the church, for the Colossians, for these people. He's willing to joyfully suffer for these people, and remember, he's never met them. He's never been there. He's never been to their church. He knows of them, but he's never even met them. He cares and is willing to give up a lot. He sacrificed his time, his energy, his health, and ultimately his life for these people. Me, on the other hand, I have a difficult time giving up a good parking spot to a stranger. Paul, not so much. He is willing to suffer for them. And that verse that we read goes on. The second half says that he's rejoicing in his suffering for them, completing in his flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is, the church. Now, don't know about you, to me, that's confusing. It sounds a little crazy, almost heretical. Like, Paul, what are you saying? Because on the surface, it sounds like Paul's trying to communicate, hey, Jesus' work on the cross, he started it, but it wasn't like necessarily all the way done. Like, I'll pick up where he left off, I'll finish the job, Jesus, don't worry. It's not necessarily what he's saying. The Bible tells us that Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection was 100% satisfactory to pay for our sins, for salvation. That he paid it all, our sins are taken care of, if we place our faith in him alone. But what Paul is saying is that, okay, I'm 
filling up what's lacking in that. So what's lacking is not the work of Jesus, but what's lacking seems to be the presentation of that truth. Paul's saying, okay, Jesus suffered to atone for our sins. Now I'm going to suffer to relay that message to everybody I can. He says there's still work to be done. He says, okay, Jesus paid for it. I'll proclaim it. And there is still work to do. And Paul makes it very clear that it will not be easy. And so that's why this is point number one for us. The Christian life is painful. Because as a Christian, this is to be expected. That it's going to hurt to get this message out. Jesus suffered. Paul is saying, hey, I'm suffering for this. We should not be surprised when difficult times come our way because of our faith. But what we need to be careful of is how we react. Instead, we should rejoice. And our suffering is probably a little less intense than Paul's, I'm guessing, for most of us at least. And even though that's true, it's still to be expected. It's still a reality. So we should be willing to rejoice when we suffer, to embrace it. We should be willing to step into that awkward conversation that may cause us or cost us some comfort or some convenience. We should be willing to make that phone call, say, hey, I don't even know if they know Jesus. I'm going to call and make sure. We should be willing to offend somebody or to receive some backlash or to lose that friendship, that relationship, or that job because of our faith. We should be willing to do or give up anything for people to hear this message. But in spite of the promised pain, Paul was so committed because he knew his purpose. And that's the second point. The Christian life is painful yet purposeful. And so the next four verses, Paul lays out like what he's all about. His focus, his intention, his aim. Here we have it. Verse 25. It says, I have become its servant. So it's referring to the church. So like I'm doing this for you guys, the church. According to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. And he says, the mystery, keep that word in mind, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. So he's saying, okay, as the church's servant, he wants them to understand what God is doing through scripture. And he calls it the mystery hidden for ages and generations. So we're left wondering, all right, so what is this mystery that was hidden but is now revealed to us? In verse 27, he tells us exactly what it is. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Plain and simple, this mystery that Paul wants everybody to know, it's Christ in you. The mystery that he's suffering to get the message across to people, what is it? Jesus. And we're at church, so Jesus is a safe answer, but it really is the answer here. He says, it's Jesus that God has chosen to include even the Gentiles in this gift of salvation. That he opens the door to every single person. doesn't matter where they're from or who they are. Everyone is included in the offer of the free gift of grace. And we hear that and go, yeah, I knew that. But when this was written 2,000 years ago, before then, generations passed, the fact that God wanted all people to be a part of his chosen people wasn't fully understood. They kind of thought it was mainly the Jewish people. Like, yeah, you know, God's favorites are the Jews, and so everyone else is kind of, you know, on the outside. They're left fending for themselves. But we hear this mystery, and it's not that much of a mystery to us. We know that Jesus died for everyone. We know that, okay, for God so loved the world that whoever believes, right? And we're all thinking, okay, I'm a Gentile and I'm saved, so um, you know what? I get it. Like, this makes sense. Uh, so it's really not a mystery to us. It'd be like if I came to you and said, guys, I got to figure it out. You'll not believe this. It is insane. Did you know the earth is round? Do you guys know that? Like, it's not flat, that if you go to the end, you're not just going to drop off into, like, nowhere or the universe. It's a sphere. It's crazy. All of you would look at me like you're looking at me now. Like, yeah, yeah, we get that. We learned that in first grade, okay? 
so it's, we hear this mystery, and it's really not a mystery to us because we have lived after Jesus. We have the recordings of Jesus' life. But for them, this is kind of groundbreaking that the people in the Old Testament, they knew that God was going to work uniquely with the Jewish people to bless all the nations, but they didn't know the details of that plan. They knew, like they had a, a knowledge of it, but they didn't, but there's mystery around the mechanics of how God was going to do that. They knew that God was going to provide hope and redeem people, but they did not know that the Son of God was going to leave heaven and come to earth. They did not know that he would live 30 plus years, that he would be with the people, that he would eat meals with sinners, that he would interact with the outcasts of society, that he would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. They didn't know that he would be crucified by Roman soldiers on a cross. They didn't know uh, all the details that he would be our substitute for God's wrath, that he would rise three days later and he would defeat death and ascend into heaven 40 days after the fact. Paul says, I'm here to make that known. I'm here to make that mystery known. And this isn't just facts on a page. This isn't just truth about, yeah, Jesus was real. He wants them to know Jesus himself, who the entire Bible points to. Every, every word, every verse, every chapter, every book, it all points to Jesus. And Paul's saying, yeah, I'm proclaiming that mystery so that everyone knows it's all about Jesus. And he calls him the hope of glory. The hope of glory. And what he means by that is if, if we have Jesus, if we have come to God and said, yeah, God, I have nothing to offer. I am a sinner. I am broken, but you sent your son Jesus to die for me. I put my faith in him and him alone. If we have done that, if we are believers and followers of him, then that's where our hope should be. And hope is a confident trust that we will spend eternity with Jesus, with our creator. That there will be one day when he will reign over sickness, over death, that we won't have to attend another funeral, there'll be no more, more broken relationships, that he will win over depression and sin and all these things, and there will be one day where he welcomes us home. And that's what hope does. Hope gives us comfort. It allows us to look past what is and allows us to find comfort in what will be. And I kind of think of it like this. Um, have you guys ever planned a vacation and you're getting ready for vacation? You're almost there. It's like the day before, but you're still at work. And so you kind of enter vacation mode before you even leave. You guys know what I mean? So you're, <laughs> all of you are like, mm-hmm, right? You, uh, so no matter what happens at work or at school, like you're just impervious to everything. Like nothing shakes you. Nothing can bring you down because guess what? Tomorrow you're on a beach somewhere or you're in the mountains or you're somewhere with your family, friends. Uh, and so anything could happen at work that day and nothing shakes you. So someone could come to you and say, hey, I'm sorry, I deleted all your files. They're all gone. Eh, no worry. I got vacation tomorrow. I'm fine. Or someone can say, hey, the copier is on fire. Can you help? Eh, well, they'll figure it out. I got vacation tomorrow. No, I don't think you understand. It's bad. The boss wants to meet with you. I think he's going to fire you. Eh, more vacation. You know, like nothing can shake you. You have confidence, you have hope that, man, tomorrow I'll be there. We can have that same confidence in Jesus, that same sureness, that same poise, and it will get us through everything. And especially when we understand our purpose. And he lays that out clearly in verse 28. He says, we proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. If you're wondering what Paul's all about, this is it. His goal, his purpose is to make the word of God known by proclaiming, teaching it, so that the church may be mature in Christ. That's what he's doing. And Paul says that God has chosen him, has commissioned him to tell people about the mystery or about the good news of Jesus. 
And he does that two different ways. He says warning and teaching. He warns people and teaches them. Warning just means to um, correct wrong thinking, to communicate what truth is not. So there is a wrong way to use your words. There is a wrong way to treat people. There is a wrong way to eternal life. But he also teaches to give correct instruction, to communicate what truth is. And so there is a right way to raise your kids. There is a right way to handle money. There is a right way to eternal life. Paul is teaching about this mystery, a.k.a. Jesus, so that everyone would be mature in Christ. Now, if you have a different translation, yours may say complete in Christ. But that word means perfect. It means whole. It means fully developed. And what Paul's not saying He's not saying that, uh, okay, I'm going to make sure that everyone's so good and they get better and better that they're sinless, that they're perfect in this life. It's not what he's saying. But he is saying that we should be growing in our faith, having more and more trust in God as we obey him more and more. Bottom line, he wants them to become more like Jesus. And quickly, I want us to notice how he does that. Like how does he help others grow? How does he help them mature? It says that he does that by proclaiming and teaching the gospel, telling them about Jesus. And I know Zach's mentioned in the past two weeks that we need to remind ourselves that we don't, uh, like, outgrow the gospel. We don't graduate from the gospel and, like, okay, yeah, I was saved, I trusted in Jesus, but now I'm ready for bigger and better, deeper things. Like, I want some more knowledge. It's just not how that works that we don't outgrow Jesus, we grow in him. That he is always, no matter what we learn about, no matter what we do, Jesus and the gospel is the center and foundation of every single thing that we do. And so he's saying, hey, this is my purpose, to proclaim Jesus. And this should be yours too. That we don't necessarily uh, live this life and we get to pick and choose. Man, this is what I want my life to be about Our purpose is given to us. It's not decided. And that purpose is to know Jesus and make him known. So when we wake up in the morning and we go throughout our day, our purpose is not to go to work and make money. Our purpose is not to uh, get our kids to practice on time. Our purpose is not to just have a smooth day and really have nothing go wrong in our lives. Our purpose is to proclaim Jesus. With our life. That's our purpose. That's our job. And we do that with integrity as we obey him and his commands. We do that with our words as we share the gospel and as we encourage. And we do that with our intentions and our actions as we not only have faith in Jesus, but we help other people build up their faith in Jesus. And that's important because we should care where others are at spiritually. And if we don't, we're missing out on a big part of our purpose. If we're not regularly sharing our faith or praying for people on a daily basis that those who are far from God would come close to him and those who do know him would be built up in their faith every day, if we're not checking up on uh, maybe a few people regularly to tell them, like, hey, I'm praying for you. How can I help you? How can I serve you? What's God teaching you? What are you struggling with? How can I, you know encourage you or build you, if we're not doing those things, there is some room to grow. And to do that, to accomplish our purpose, it can't be done alone. Thankfully, the Christian life is not only painful and purposeful, but the last point, it's also powerful. In verse 29, Paul says this. He says, I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. Paul is praying. He is exhausting himself. He is straining to help others mature. But he's not alone. He says, I'm not using my strength. I'm using a strength that is much more powerful, God's strength. And he keeps going on in verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, for I want you to know how greatly I am struggling for you, for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me in person. I want their hearts 
to be encouraged and joined together in love, so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable, for I may be absent in body, but I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well ordered you are in the strength of your faith in Christ. Paul, again, cares for them. He wants them to be encouraged. He wants them to be unified. He wants them to be assured in their faith, that they're not persuaded by maybe other arguments or other religions or other philosophies that, man, they, you know, they sound good. It's like, okay, well, I, I, I heard this, so maybe Jesus isn't the only way. He doesn't want them shaken by that. He wants them confident that they are complete in Jesus. But for him to do that, he needs help. And just as it's true for Paul, it's true for us as well. That God himself is our source of power and strengthens us to do these things. John 15, Jesus said himself that apart from me, you can do nothing. If that's true, we need help. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So if we want to be effective, we need to realize that we are not strong enough. And if we think about it, if you're like me now and in the past, I think a lot of us ask for God's strength all the time, right? Like we pray and ask God, God, would you help my team win today? It's really important. Or maybe before a test, you pray, man, God, would you help me remember everything I've studied? And even things that I haven't read that you would make them appear in my mind and just help me really pass this test. Or before an interview that you're excited for, you're nervous. Like we, we do that from time to time. But just because we ask for it doesn't mean we have it. Because here's the truth that I want us to understand. God only empowers his purposes. Does that make sense? God only empowers his purposes. So he's empowering Paul because Paul is doing things in line with God's interests. And we may say, okay, well, why does God kind of pick and choose like that? Well, we do the same thing, that we empower things and empower purposes that matter to us. Like we give our time, our energy, our resources, our power to things or causes that we believe in, right? Like some of us may give, um, you know, to charity or a lot of us are generous to grace here uh, because, you know, they're causes that you believe in, you want to support. Or you give your time, your energy, your effort towards other people to serve them, to care for them. You give to your kids. You provide your own resources to them. Why do we do those things? Because we believe in them. We want to support them. We, they, they fall in line with, okay, I think this is important, so I'm going to empower it. I'm going to support it. And we do that, but you wouldn't give to a cause that you do not believe in, right? Like if I came to you guys this morning and said, all right, I'm looking to make a purchase. I've been thinking about it a long time. And uh, I think it's, it's just time. Uh, but I can't do it without your support, without your help. I want to buy a Ferrari. Okay? I picked one out. It's not the cheapest one, but it's not the most expensive. It's $300,000. Um, I've been kind of late to work recently, and I hear they go fast. So this might help. And uh, I would really love if you guys would support my cause. I'm guessing... <laughs> Probably none of you would give me a dime. If you do want to support that cause, I can talk to you. Just write back those doors after, after church. It's a joke, by the way. Um, but you wouldn't, right? Because you probably, as long as it's safe and I get from A to B, you don't care what I drive. And no one really wants to see one of their pastors in a $300,000 sports car, okay? It just doesn't sit well. You would not empower that cause because you don't believe in it. In the same way, we shouldn't go to God and ask him for help with things that don't fill his purpose, that don't fulfill what he's interested in or what aligns with him. And so we need to realize that if we want his power, we have to be about his purpose. We have to be about proclaiming Jesus with our life, using God's strength, not ours. And sometimes I feel like it's, it's kind of easy, like I, you may sit and listen to me say, okay, um, 
I'm supposed to use God's strength. Got it. How do I do that? Like, how do I know I have it? Paul's confident that God is working powerfully in him. How do I know? What do I do? What's the step? He tells us in the very next verse. Verse 6 and 7. He says, so then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him. He says, just as you have received Christ, continue to walk in him that way, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Paul's saying, finish how you started. Whatever you did in the beginning, continue doing that. And so then we ask ourselves, all right, how did I begin this relationship with God? What did I do to receive Jesus? I had faith. I trusted him. I came to God and said, I have nothing. I'm broken. I humbly admit that, God, I need you. Paul's saying, if you want God's strength, keep doing that. Keep totally depending on him. Because we need him, we need his strength, because the Christian life is not hard, it's impossible. And we can't do it alone. So it looks like practically, one, making sure that we're living in line with God's purposes. But two, it's asking God for strength. It's praying to him, it's depending on him, it's saying, God, give me wisdom to know what to pursue, to what not to pursue, what's important, what I should just, you know, let alone. It's saying, God, give me energy today. I'm tired. I didn't get good sleep. I'm exhausted. But give me energy to go the extra mile and to serve people. God, give me boldness. God, give me more patience and joy so that I can love people better. God, I can't do this alone. I need you. That's what we should be doing. If we want God's strength, Paul says just continue having faith, continue depending on God completely. And so if we sum up all three, we can expect the Christian life to be painful, purposeful, and powerful. And so what I want to do as we wrap up is uh, in kind of each of those three categories, I want to give us a little homework. I want to give us a challenge for each of them. Because I, I don't want us just leaving here going, okay, great, that's awesome news, but what do I do with it? So we need to ask ourselves, okay, as a Christian, this life is painful. So a little self-evaluation, how am I suffering? There's probably an area in all of our lives, at least one, that you can point to and go, yeah, don't love that. Wish that wasn't the case. I wish this person wasn't, you know, uh, causing this much grief in my life. I wish this money or this job, whatever it is, ask yourself, are you suffering well? Are you frustrated through it or do you have joy in the midst of it? So my challenge for that is whatever you're going through, whatever that one thing is, pray to God at least once a day, every day this week, and thank him for it. Thank God for what you're going through. Because so I think what we need to realize is it might change our perspective. It's an opportunity to grow and to depend on him. Thank him for that so that you'd have joy in the midst of it. But not only that, as a Christian, this life is purposeful. So we ask ourselves, am I living out God's purposes instead of mine? And so the challenge for that is simply, and, and this one might be a little more tougher, or a little tougher, is si evaluate your, your days, your week, your schedule. Like what do you emphasize during your week? What are you uh, most excited about? Like, how do you plan your day? I, all of us have responsibilities that we have to do. But do we care more about our interests, our interests more than God? Do we care about what we want more than what God wants? And if that's the case, there is room to improve and we can make a change. But the Christian life is also powerful. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we trusting in God's strength on a daily basis? Or our own. And the challenge for that is simply to give up control. To realize that to honor God, you are not capable. I am not capable. That we need him. And so we ask God to give us the power to obey him. We ask God to help us 
to give strength uh, to help us with that family issue, that relationship, that there's still some bitterness and unforgiveness. We ask God to help us with that sin that we just cannot, you know, get over. We ask God to strengthen us uh, in the midst of our fear, in the midst of our anxiety to give us peace. And we ask God to help us help others, to strengthen them, to encourage them, to build them up in their walk with the Lord. Moment by moment, we are to keep trusting him, keep coming to him, keep needing him. We don't want you to miss out on the potential that there is if you live like Paul did. That Paul, even in the midst of whatever life threw his way, he was rejoicing in his suffering. He lived out God's purposes, and he did it using his strength. And we have the opportunity to do that starting today. Let's go ahead and pray as we wrap up this morning. Dear God, we thank you first and foremost for your son, Jesus, that you have given us life, and we've used that freedom to rebel against you. But I pray and we just thank you for your love, that in, in, in spite of our mess-ups and our sin, you still chose to send him to die in place of what we deserve. And I pray that all of us would come to a place of trusting in that alone. And God, I'm asking that you would help us line up with your purposes, that we would know what's important in life, that no matter what we're going through, whatever sufferings or painful moments we have, that we would rejoice in the midst of it because we know you are with us. And so we would direct our aim, our effort, our day around you, that we would proclaim Jesus with our life. And to do that, we need your help. God, empower us, give us strength, give us wisdom and self-control to do what's right, to honor you in the midst of it. We ask things in your son's name. Amen. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you here next week at Grace.